it brings me joy to share heirloom sewing techniques. I know that in doing so, I might be a very small part of something important in history. I might serve as a bridge between the past and the future, just as my mother and grandmother did. You are part of that connection too. The sewing skills we use to make beautiful Christian gowns and heirloom quilts have endured for centuries. These sewing skills are just as essential in the making of heirloom clothing today as they were long ago. It is a joyful blessing for us to practice this heirloom art together. Thank you for joining me today in my sewing room. One of my very favorite heirloom sewing techniques is Madeira applique. Now today we're going to share with you some magic Madeira because you know I love to do things the easy way. So let me just show you how beautiful the Madeira applique is. This is an example of Madeira applique, this darling little top to the bodice is Madeira applique. Now this is a little trim that has been added and then the pretty piping. And if you'll come on down to the bottom of this cute little polka dotted dress, you'll see a really cute little ruffle. Now, now let's talk about the Madeira applique, the magic Madeira, the easy way. Here is the um, bodice, the front facing of the dress, and now you trace it off. Do you notice this is on the fold line? We trace the pattern off. Now the blue line, where we're going to sew first, is this line right here on the bottom, and I'm going to do the sewing while it's still in a whole piece. I'm going to sew with wash away basting thread. That is critical to do wash away basting thread, and I'll show you why in just a minute. Now, after I have sewn the wash away basting thread, then it's time to cut the whole, whole little yoke piece out. Now, I'm going to notch along here, that is critical. Then I'm going to turn it right side out, and then I'm going to take spray starch and press it. And remember, this is the wash away basting thread. So I'm going to take spray starch and wet it, and then I'm going to press till dry, press till dry, press till dry, or you will cry. It has to be bone dry. And then here's where the magic comes in. I love to show this. After you've pressed it till dry, it, I, you pull it, and it just pops apart. Isn't that wonderful? That is a totally finished Madeira applique piece. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is to add the trim. Trim comes with a little seam allowance, and we need to trim that seam allowance, and once again, do a few notches. I'm gonna slip it under the beautiful piece that we've just done. I'm going to glue baste it, because I don't want two rows of stitching. I'm gonna glue baste it, and then later we'll stitch. And then here's another magic Madeira. This is windowpane Madeira, and all of these things, these techniques are going to be really unraveled to you right now. I'm so happy to have as my guest today, Hope Yoder. Hope is the owner of Designs by Hope Yoder Incorporated. She is a Martha Pullen licensed teacher. She's a designer for So Beautiful magazine, and she is a regular teacher at the School of Art Fashion in Huntsville. Hope, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Martha. I'm going to show you Madeira three different ways. You saw Martha doing the traditional Madeira applique where you'll take a template and you'll cut it out and you're going to fold right sides together and lay the template along the fold. We're going to sew with water soluble basting thread. Once we've sewn, we're going to cut out the top and the neckline and the side seam and then we're going to trim leaving a quarter of an inch seam allowance. You need to make little notches in there so I would finish trimming this section. I'm going to, as Martha said, press with starch. So I'm going to wet this and not touch it and pick it up and press it till it's dry. And once it's dry, then the magic happens and you can pull that apart. I love that sound, I Martha. I love it. And it's finished. It's magic. <laughs> and if I wanted to add a little more sparkle to it, I could take some Victorian edging and I could trim the seam allowance and make little clips. And then I could take my glue stick and I could turn this over and I could apply some glue and then go ahead and glue baste the Victorian edging. So you have the finished bodice ready or the Madeira border to put on the bodice. The second way is a double scallop. So I'm going to take my template, cut it out, and I'm going to take two pieces of fabric and put them right sides together. 
And so when I do that, I need a scrap fabric. So this will be my waste fabric. And here's the drawn line. I'm going to put right sides together, turn it over, and I'm gonna sew right on the side of the scallops. So as I sew, then I'll need to do the same thing and I'll trim on Does both that wash sides. Wash away basting thread again. Right. Okay. Wash on away both basting sides. thread. Okay. And once I do that, it looks like this. And so for this, because this is my waste fabric, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna cut it right up the middle so that I can turn it right side out. And then I'm gonna spray it with starch. And once I do that, this is the waste fabric that is now garbage and you'll have your finished double scallop. Now the third way, this is really fun, I'm gonna create a little window pane effect. So I'm gonna hoop very starched um, handkerchief linen and I'm gonna take a very heavy water soluble stabilizer and I'm gonna lay it on top of my hoop. Now I have no other stabilizer underneath because this is an in the hoop window pane border. And so I've stitched it in the hoop and the reason I do it in the hoop is because it's gonna give me a perfect teardrop. If I tried to sew that without being in the hoop, it wouldn't be so perfect. With this, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna cut a hole and I'm gonna cut in here and I'm gonna remove the center. When I get the center cut out, then I'm gonna take this, this creates a facing and I'm gonna run the stabilizer to the wrong side and that leaves me with turn under edges so that I can slip a pre-embroidered piece of fabric over there, glue baste it, and top stitch a little spaghetti bias around there. So that gives me a nice window pane opening. And you can see a practical application right here on my blouse or make a cute pillow. So what do you think, Madeira three ways? Uh, Madeira three ways, Hope, and isn't it magic with the wash away basting thread? Just remember to take it out. <laughs> to press till dry, press till dry. <laughs> or you'll cry. Press till dry, you will cry, and then it's gone. Oh yeah, take it out of your machine. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> take oh, it out, don't continue very, sewing. Very important. Hope, thank you so much. And now Hope has some sewing inspirations for you. I hope I just love these projects you brought to share. Tell us about this wonderful uh, bag. Well, this is my purse, and this was actually done in the hoop, the Madeira border like we did uh, on my sleeve. I've done this in the hoop with wash away basting thread. And this adorable little baby block. Isn't Good. that cute? Those are little blank coasters that we appliqued and then made it into a soft block. It would go great in a nursery or for a child to play with. Wonderful, wonderful ideas here. Would you tell us what we got here? This is the technique, the Madeira double scallop border. So I embroidered it first and then I used the wash away basting thread and the scrap fabric to create a double scallop. And then all those wonderful lace shapes. And I think we have a variation on the double scallop right. here, don't we? The double scallop, if you look real close, I've done the double scallop, but then I took a rotary cutter and cut it up the middle, and that created two mirror image parts that then I top stitched onto a white blouse, giving you a tone on tone white effect. Absolutely beautiful. And you know, one of my favorite, of course, is the lace shaping and the tied bow. And that's similar to the shirt that I'm wearing. And what we did was the in the hoop Sleeve what, application okay, with sheer kind of organdy. that over here. This is another one of these in the hoop oh, right. window pane. And spaghetti bias, we did a facing and then actually top stitch the spaghetti bias around the neckline and then trim the facing back so that gave a little color around your neck. And this wonderful uh, tied bow with what I call the frog leg lace uh, ties. I, have, I haven't frog heard that. Legs. Oh, frog, frog legs, legs. <laughs> absolutely. They go back and forth. Looks a little like frog legs. Okay. Frog leg lace. I bet that's a new one. <laughs> we should teach that somewhere. Go on the road and teach frog leg lace. <laughs> Hope we do a lot of teaching and a lot of traveling. I understand these are some of your projects you're currently teaching. Yes, the blouse and the bag are current projects. I love it. Hope, thank you so much. We, have, we do have fun, don't we? We do. Thank you so much. And now I have an antique technique to share with you.
one of my favorite places in the whole world to shop for beautiful vintage white clothes is at Portobello Road in London. I get there just when the store is open, which is usually about eight o'clock, and, and we just shop and shop. Well, I was at Portobello Road not too many years ago, and I went into an antique shop, and this blouse really caught my eye. I love to look for sewing techniques and, and embroidery. The, you can see the blouse has just a pretty little collar, and by the way, it opens up, up and down the front, which is kind of unusual. Speaking of the opening, I think these, I think there were covered snaps originally. They're all gone, so we just have for your uh, viewing pleasure today, it's pinned because the snaps are gone. Now, what I want the technique I'd like to share with you today, and I call this the daisy, the daisy uh, embroidered. Uh, pin tuck, except that they aren't pin tucks, they're folded tucks, the tucked blouse. You see these beautiful uh, cross-hatched um, uh, folded tucks here and the embroidery that's in between, all done by hand, I might add. Let me just show you the details that this lady used. Um, she just made some more beautiful cuffs and put her French lace around it, but she did her cuffs out of this same fabric. And you know, the Victorians uh, made their things just as beautiful on the back as on the front. So I'm going to turn this around so you can enjoy looking at the back too. More beauty. Now I want you to look at one thing. Do you see how the fullness of the blouse these, these tucks, when these are released tucks, they stop. So the, the vertical tucks are released and that gives you fullness for the back of this blouse. Now this is very easy to produce today, to reproduce today. Let me just show you how. When we're going to do um, the, the tucks, these are the cross tucks, first of all, we have to draw a grid. So go ahead and draw your grid on your fabric. And by the way, I work with a big piece of fabric like this, the cutting out comes after everything is done. So the grids are drawn, and the first tucks that we're going to do are the uh, horizontal tucks. These are folded tucks, traditional tucks, the horizontal tucks. Now you notice there's no fullness in or out of the blouse this way. The fullness for the blouse comes when we do the vertical tucks. The horizontal tucks are done, and next, I bet you already guessed it. Next, we do the vertical tucks. And do you see how the fullness of the tucks, when they're released and they, they're tied off right here, then we have the fullness actually for the blouse or the dress or whatever you're using it. Now, after all of this is done, if you would like to put machine or hand embroidery, you just decide how many of the little squares that you would like to put embroidery in and just do embroidery of whatever kind you want to. And then my suggestion is to cut the blouse out at that point. And I want you to know when I do, when I've been shopping literally all over the world to find these beautiful antiques, I've always thought about you and about bringing them back to share with you. And so I hope you're enjoying the vintage clothes on Martha's Sewing Room, as well as some of the techniques. And now we have a beautiful section on heirloom quilting for you. So pleased to have as my guest today, Nina McVeigh. Nina is an educator trainer for Bernina of America. Nina, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. And I love this quilt. And I think Thank the you. details we're going to talk about today are these beautiful double needle yes. pin tucks with the little, you have the little bead at every intersection. So beautiful. Yes, well, I love doing pin tucking, uh, as many of us do. Uh, and of course, for those who haven't quite um, experienced it yet, or maybe um, you know all about it but just haven't done it, um, you're going to start out with a double needle and then a pin tucking foot. And I have my guide on my pin tucking foot because once I do one row, then I'm going to set my guide to uh, whatever distance I want those pin tucks apart. I've also done corded pin tucks for these, and so I've used a buttonhole gimp and put it through my cording guide, and I've done my pin tucks all in one direction, and then I've turned my fabric and come back across. So I've done what I would call a gridded square of pin tucks. Um, and this, of course, is where you can put a little bead um, afterwards when you're all done. That also is how that particular quilt is quilted in that area. Okay. Okay. And once I have my square done and my whole grid done, I'm then going to cut this in half. For our quilt, you need two gridded squares. So then you're going to cut that in half and have your four um, outer triangles or your setting triangles. So let me just position these here. So this is what our block would look like. 
I like to lay all of this out before I do any sewing because the one thing that I want to look at, and it should, it should line up, but sometimes you have to play with your triangles. You want to make sure that your pin tucks are going to line up here um, all the way across so that uh, it doesn't look funny. Uh, the other thing that I like to do is make these squares or these triangles a little bit bigger than I really need them because I can always trim them down uh, when I square this block up. So what I'm going to do is take my inner block and just put a little finger fold so I'm finding the center of that side. And that way I can take my pin tucked piece find the center and put right sides together. Okay. So now I'll go to the machine and I will sew a quarter of an inch seam allowance. And using a patchwork foot is certainly going to keep you straight as well as dual feed will also keep these two layers moving very smoothly and at the same rate of speed. And what you'll notice when you put this first side on is that that triangle does extend further than one might think it needs to. Okay. And I always do this side and then again the opposite side. So as I had this laid out, I would then choose this uh, triangle and put it on here and then I would go ahead and of course you need to find your centers and then I would go ahead and do my ends but opposite sides first so that you okay. can press them and then after it's all finished though, those wonderful beads can be added yes. which I just absolutely yeah. love well it adds a little bit of a sparkle uh, to those setting uh, triangles Nina so thank you so it. much for sharing these wonderful ideas You're and welcome. this beautiful beautiful quilt that we are totally enjoying it here at Martha's Sewing Room and now I have some hand embroidery to share with you I'm so happy to have as my guest today, Wendy Shane. Wendy is the designer of Petite Crochet Patterns. She's the author of five books, a regular contributor to So Beautiful Magazine, and a teacher at the Martha Pullen School of Art Fashion in Huntsville. Wendy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Martha. Today I've brought a little dress that has this adorable little pocket on it, and this is actually a form of hem stitching or drawn thread work. It's called shadow hem stitching, shadow square hem stitching. So let me show you how easy this one is. So cute. Oh, me. <laughs> Anytime I can incorporate shadow work in a project, I'm happy. I love shadow work. So, <laughs> I do too. Anyway, I want to show you this grid. So what I've done is I have just removed certain numbers of threads, and this can be just about any number of threads you want to remove to make a grid that consists of nine squares. I'm going to shadow embroider every other square so that one is stitched and the other isn't. Now, keep in mind I'm working from the wrong side, so I actually have the fabric inverted in the hoop. I'm going to start by putting a waist knot and I'm going to work the upper left hand square. And I want to just take care to bring these stitches very small here because remember this is the the, actually, this is the back side, so you want to keep the stitches as small on the other side as possible. Okay, so I'm back where I need to be, right in the corner. You want to exit right out the little square. If you see that little open area, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, now we're going to begin doing a closed herringbone stitch or a shadow work stitch from one end to the other. And while we do that, we're going to bundle a certain number of threads each time, and we want to make, remain consistent with that number. And I'm going to go ahead and do three. So the first thing I want to do is hold the thread above the needle and bring the needle underneath three fabric threads. Just slide the needle back and forth to make sure that you've got a clean stitch. You didn't pick up any threads from the other um, side. So you can see the first stitch is just looped around those fabric threads. Now the next one is down at the bottom. The same number of threads and even with the first um, three threads. 
Now back up to the top and the bottom. This goes back and forth. Remember, we're keeping the same number of threads consistent. Now, um, what happens with this stitch is this particular um, type of stitching is actually very similar to regular shadow work or shadow or closed herringbone stitch, however you want to call it. But notice I only have threads going in the same direction. All right, so what happens when you get to the end is then you have to switch to the other direction. So I have a sample to show you that. Okay, so now here's my, my next uh, sample and it's showing the first row completely completed. Now I'm gonna turn it one turn and then I'm going to, here, here we go. Then I'm gonna stitch, first stitch will be in on the other edge at the same set corner where I'm emerging. Take my first stitch there, come back up to the top, stitch there, back to the bottom. So I wind up with actually two rows of shadow stitches. And what that is going to do is it's going to give me a row of back stitches around the whole square on the other side. Okay, so now um, I have another, another sample to show you a little bit farther down the line. Let's see. Okay, so now my next example illustrates almost complete, the completion of uh, almost complete second direction. So let me finish it off and I'll show you how to work to the next square. Okay, so we wanna work these squares on the diagonal. So we wanna work across from corner to corner first. Then we'll have to come back and do the other, the other direction too. So now that's my last stitch. So uh, let me show you what happens here on the other side. As you can see, there are my back stitches all around and the threads that cross over cause the color effect or the shadowing. Now, when, you, when I'm going to do my, planning to do my next square, it'll be this one. So I want to bring the needle beneath the stitches so that it emerges right on that corner. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to begin going from top to bottom with my stitches back and forth, just as I did before. First this direction, then the, the opposite direction, just like we did, and then I'll work to this square. Then I'm going to have to, with a new thread, tie on here and work this way. Let me show you what it looks like finished. When it is. Absolutely beautiful. And there it is. Half Absolutely half. beautiful. In, in the bigger version and then the teeny tiny version right. of this sweet little dress. <laughs> this is blown up so you can see. Thank you, Wendy. Better. <laughs> and now I'd like to share a piece from my vintage collection with you. This beautiful little dress has so many really interesting features. And by the way, I did purchase this in London. I absolutely love the way the hand embroidery is stitched on the netting. This, of course, is the cotton netting. Absolutely beautiful, heavy uh, padded satin stitch on the bodice. And then the sleeves have a really interesting, it really isn't an entre -dos, it's kind of a wider uh, trim. More of the beautiful hand embroidery on the netting sleeves and then a traditional lace and the beautiful trim. So this is something interesting. The silk on the bottom of this sleeve is ecru. Now let's go back over here to the bodice. Tiny baby entredot in between the lace and the netting. And then there's a casing of the netting that wide ribbon has been run through, and this time it has ecru also. Again, more tiny entredot before the gathered skirt is joined. Coming down to the bottom of the skirt, pretty, pretty, pretty. Three tucks, three tucks, three tucks. A long time ago, I was told by one of the antique dealers in London that any time you had three, it possibly stood for the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and could have been for a religious occasion. So this might have been for a little girl's first uh, communion or confirmation. Once again, we have the entredot, and do you see the little scallops on the bottom of the skirt with the silk? I'm gonna turn this around really quickly. So you can see that the back is really almost identical with the beautiful casing that the wide, wide ribbon has run, been run through to tie the sash. And the little buttons are hidden. The little buttons and button loops are hidden. Once again, a beautiful dress, which will be so much fun to produce today, especially with your machine that embroiders. 
thank you so much for joining me in my sewing room today. I hope you've had as much fun as I have, and I would like to invite you to come back next time.